I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the funding secured fraud trial. Elon Musk could lose billions in court over his infamous 2018 tweet. Jury selection is underway over an investor lawsuit after Musk claimed he had funding to take Tesla private all that five years ago. And Ryan Cohen's latest bet on Alibaba risks a clash with Beijing. We look into his requests and investor activism in China. Plus, Tinder and Hinge think users are willing to cough up big bucks. We're talking up to $500 per month for an elite membership subscription on dating apps. Oh, we're going to have fun with that one, as you did on social media when we took a poll of your thoughts on it. But first and foremost, let's look at what this market is doing, Ed, because we're looking at the Nasdaq actually managing to cling on to gains for a seventh straight day, longest winning streak since November 2021, even in the face of the S&P 500 falling lower and basically muted movements across the board, whether you're looking at Europe and indeed what's happening worldwide. We're cautiously trading at the moment. And in fact, the MSCI World Index was basically flat on the day as we see Nasdaq managing to eke out just a little bit of growth, even though the S&P managed to snap its five-day rally. And Nasdaq may be taking cues more from the borrowing costs. We saw yields overall fall some three basis points. Now, this on the two-year, the front end, showing that maybe the market's getting a little bit more confident that inflation pressure is in the rearview mirror, where at least peak inflation is. We saw that perhaps with the Empire Manufacturing data today. So hopes that the Federal Reserve will be able to calm on their focus on inflation. That's helping the moon music around tech. But flip it on, tell you what, moon music is still looking strong around Bitcoin for 13, I think, at least straight days. It is the most, we get, no, 14 days, and it's since 2013 that we last saw such a long winning streak for this crypto OG. We're seeing up 28% since the start of January. What a winning start to the year for crypto. Yeah, it's interesting to see the kind of risk on mentality broadly. You look at the Nasdaq 100 as well, equities continuing to see gains. But there's a narrative around an earnings recession that's coming as we kind of creep into earnings season. We get underway this Thursday of Netflix. Apple continuing to push higher up nine tenths of one percent and outperformer on the Nasdaq 100. That is we get the first launch of the year, the new Macs, the new Mac minis, which we'll dig into with Mark Gurman. Roblox up almost 12 percent, really strong performance, biggest jump in around three months as they ended 2022 strong at a Peers for the video game maker in terms of bookings. And then there are some movers to the downside. We're going to talk about Ryan Cohen and his activist investor bet on Alibaba later in the show. But it was really interesting given that Cohen's more of repute around his bets on the so-called meme stocks that we've seen over the last two years or so. I think Amazon's really interesting as well. Down 2%, a drag on the Nasdaq 100 on a points perspective. But you have to remember it was coming off a run of, I think it was six straight days of gains or seven straight days of gains, which is its longest streak in some time. It was really going into overbought territory. So some pullback on Amazon after a recent decent run. Tesla, really interesting. Best performer on the S&P 500. Uh, really an outlier when it comes to the performance of Tuesday's session. There were lots of sell side analysts kind of reacting to the price cuts we saw in North America, some of them pointing uh, to the erosion that will have and potentially Tesla missing EBITDA uh, when earnings roll around. The other way of looking at it is they're talking now about an autos price war. And if there is an autos price war, well, actually, when you compare Tesla to some of the legacy automakers globally, it's got more margin to play with than others do, which is interesting. But of course, in the background, its CEO is here in San Francisco, Carrie. He certainly is. Let's dive into that. Elon Musk set to be, what, a star witness at a jury trial that started Tuesday in San Francisco federal court. As you mentioned, Ed, it's over his infamous tweets just all that time ago, four and a half years ago, to be precise, about a plan to take the EV maker private with, quote, funding secured. Bloomberg's Peter Blumberg joins us to get us up to speed with basically who's likely to win here, Peter, because it's, they're going to be going at it. And we know Elon Musk quite likes a bit of a fight. Well, he does. And it's it's really unusual for a case like this, a, a securities fraud trial brought by uh, private investors as a class action to it, it, it's unlike it for it to go to trial in the first place. Usually they settle because there's so much money at stake. And in this case, there, there's billions of dollars on the line. But as you say, uh, Musk is always up for a fight. And in this case, he's at a really unusual disadvantage because the judge ruled months ago that the tweets were false. And the judge is going to tell that to the jury at the get-go. There's still other things that the jury has to decide, and it could still be resolved in Musk's favor. But it's definitely a disadvantage for him going into this. 
I think let's talk about the mechanics. I, I, as you know, Peter, you've been my editor on more than one occasion covering these kind of blow-by-blow -blow trials. But the, the jury's key here, and so are the mechanics. So we're going through jury selection right now. And uh, not a surprise, some of the potential jurors had issues with Elon Musk. Remember, Elon Musk tried to move this trial away from San Francisco because he argued there was bias among the jury pool. But this isn't going to happen quickly, and Elon Musk is going to be a star witness. So walk us through what happens from here. Right. Well, they're, they're getting close to selecting a jury, and they've been uh, very carefully uh, questioning the jurors about their views and whether they can uh, commit to being fair and impartial. And, uh, of course, the lawyers on both sides uh, get, get uh, a chance to uh, speak up and dismiss uh, jurors that they don't uh, feel comfortable with. But uh, there's a, a, cons a, a feeling that they're going to reach a consensus before the end of the day and pick a jury. And then we've got about a two and a half week trial uh, where we will hear from a variety of witnesses uh, beyond Musk himself, uh, including some of the high finance people who were involved in some of the behind the scenes talks about uh, funding this transaction, as well as uh, some professor types, uh, expert witnesses who are going to talk to the jury about their theories of how the tweets may have influenced uh, investors to make trades, and also to talk about uh, what kind of uh, uh, damage this yeah. did to investors and how much money they should collect. Peter Bloomberg, thank you for getting us up to speed. It's going to run for a little while, I think, at least until February 1st. Meanwhile, Apple, it just rolled out its new products of 2023. Have you spotted that Ed has a new Apple product on him today, in fact? But we digress from various broken phones and we go back to the high-end MacBook Pro, the laptops, as well as the Mac Mini desktop. They've just been announced today. Let's see what all the fuss is all about. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. They haven't been announced, but they've gone on sale, right, Mark? What do we know about these products that you hadn't already broken in the past? Yeah, so the new MacBook Pro and the new Mac Mini, those were introduced today. They're available for pre-order on Apple's website, and they start shipping on January 24th, uh, so just in about a week from now. Now, these are marginal upgrades. They look identical to the previous models. The Mac Mini last rolled out in 2020, the first Mac to get the M1 chip, part of the transition away from Intel. The Mac Pro last updated at the end of 2021. Now, why are these so significant? Well, they introduced the new generation of Apple's chips. So the Mac Mini gets the same M2 chip launched in the MacBook Air in the low-end 13-inch MacBook Pro last year, but it also gets the first M2 Pro chip. That adds a little bit more horsepower on both the CPU and the GPU side. So the CPU is the chip that is for the main performance, the overall speed of the computer, while the GPU handles graphics and video editing uh, and stuff of that nature. Now, the MacBook Pro also gets that same M2 Pro chip in the Mac Mini, but also a more advanced chip called the M2 Max, which essentially doubles the amount of horsepower you get on the graphics side. So that's really a high-end machine for video editors, uh, programmers, engineers, and such that really need the most horsepower you can get uh, in a laptop. What uh, Caroline was alluding to, Mark, is this weekend I dropped my phone, and it smashed, and now I face a choice of whether to upgrade or wait. You and I talk about this behind closed doors all the time. Anyway, we digress. What Tim Cook alluded to in a tweet was Apple Silicon, right? You're just talking about it there, that the emphasis Apple's had not just on supply chain, but controlling its IP, controlling its technology. What I'm confused about is I thought that this latest gen of Mac was supposed to come out last year, 2022. Was there a delay? What happened? So there was a delay. So the M2 line first started rolling out uh, in last year. It started uh, to launch actually at the end of July. There was a delay back then because of the manufacturing facilities in China. They all got shut down for about a month. That delayed the rollout of the MacBook Air and the 13-inch uh, MacBook Pro. That, in addition to other factors regarding the chip shortage and the overall need to allocate more manufacturing to more pressing products like the iPhones and the iPads last year and the Apple Watches, meant that something had to give. And what gave was, these, was this new MacBook Pro and the Mac Mini. Those were originally supposed to roll out uh, this past October. All right. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman always bringing us the latest headlines and gadgets from the world of Apple.
Now, Microsoft plans to cut jobs in a number of engineering divisions as early as Wednesday. That according to a Bloomberg source. It's unclear how many of the 200,000 workers will be affected. And it is the third round of layoffs since July of last year. Microsoft, which declined to comment, has also eliminated open positions and paused hirings in many departments. And we're going to keep on the conversation of Microsoft because coming up, it's going all in on chat GPT as it looks to kind of weave it into its Azure offering pretty soon. We'll talk about the generative AI opportunities at Microsoft and also industry-wide with Michael Dempsey, his managing partner at Compound. This is Bloomberg. GPT, Ed, it is still in the headlines, and this time because Microsoft's putting the tool to use, right? This, after the tech giant, we already know reportedly is mulling an additional $10 billion investment in ChatGPT's creator OpenAI, but just get us up to speed with what Microsoft's overall plans are. Yeah, this was a, an interesting and curiously timed blog post from the company, partly because Davos is going on and you know how things work over in Davos, but also because of how fresh that reporting was around them in boosting their funding into OpenAI, right? They'd already invested a billion in 2019. Put simply, they're going to take OpenAI's tools and bring them into the Azure cloud platform, actually. And if we flip up the boards, we can get some detail on that. In some limited capacity since 2021, Microsoft has often offered a very small group of its Azure clients the ability to use OpenAI tools if they have their own tools hosted in Azure Cloud. That all sounds very niche, but frankly, simply put, if you're a company that hosts your own tools on the Azure Cloud platform, you have now access to use GPT 3.5, DALI, for example, and now they're making that more accessible. They're opening it up to a wide, uh, wider range of customers. Why do we care? Well, we were asking when that news came around about the $10 billion potential investment. What's in it for Microsoft? There is a lot of emphasis on Bing, their search engine, right? How could ChatGPT in particular improve that platform? But read Dina Bass's reporting on the Bloomberg Tunnel or Bloomberg.com. There are other use cases as well about how the language models and the underlying artificial intelligence could improve Office, for example, and Teams, Microsoft Teams as well. So it's a really interesting development that they're now being a little bit more open about, although there was still a lot that they did not say in that blog post. Yeah. More questions than answers, it's always the way, Ed, but let's put more questions to one Michael Dempsey now. His managing partner over at Compound has a number of investments, actually, in AI and machine learning startups, over $200 million in assets under management. Michael, great to catch up with you. And give us the iteration, the scale, the applications you're most excited about for something like ChatGPT or generative AI. Yeah, I think for ChatGPT specifically, search is probably the thing that gets everyone really excited. Um, on a first order, you can think about how existential that is to Google and how their kind of economic model works. I think as you start to see more and more of these use cases become more um, emergent and more professional ready in, in areas that start off as needing kind of inspiration, move towards needing 90% perfection and eventually make their way all the way to kind of 99 plus, you can think of like legal as an example. Um, and then in, the, in those middle areas, you can think of areas like uh, biology, material discovery, things like that, uh, as well as a bunch of other enterprise software use cases. So mm. we really think this is something that's interesting across a bunch of different industries and is going to uh, cut into a bunch of different companies' kind of supposed moats over time. A lot of hype and actually a lot of hand-wringing around some of the ethics around it all, Michael. Is that developing simultaneously with the innovation? Are you worried about basically the rules, regulations, the steering of the road not being formed quickly enough? Um, I think with all emergent technologies, especially when they get the type of adoption that's been kind of rampant for ChatGPT, you see this concern around can we roll this out properly, which is ironic because OpenAI was originally built around this idea of deploying AI in a kind of safe manner. Um, I, I don't worry about it as much. I think there's a lot of open questions around kind of artist attribution, around um, kind of fair right usage of different types of data, where if you're pulling from a different source, a bunch of different sources, should you need to cite those sources? But in general, I think that the value continually outstrips kind of the, the downsides, and we really should focus on um, the, the optimistic version of these technologies. 
are you surprised as somebody tracking the space between the time that reports came out, Microsoft was thinking about boosting its investment in OpenAI, and then last night when a blog post comes out talking about how they're going to incorporate the underlying technology into their own platforms. As somebody that knows how these deals work and also what the utility is, what's your read on the news announcements? I think it's just a continual, um, you know, it, it, I just continually am impressed by Microsoft over years now. And I think they see the strategic asset that having these kind of foundation models and uh, large language models implemented into their products uh, can be, and also it can allow them to potentially leapfrog competitors. And I think what you're going to see is, um, as we all know, a lot of other large companies that are figuring out what are they going to do. Google is the most notable one on the sideline. I think they have bigger regulatory uh, headwinds. And so they are being very, very careful about this. But I think all of us knew the scale of people there that care about these problems, that are um, kind of very interested in figuring out, you know, what are the ways in which we can um, disrupt ourselves and or disrupt our biggest competitors. And for Microsoft, it's always been about disrupting competitors and specifically doing it from the enterprise layer. And I think what we're going to see is that Microsoft's ambitions are going to continue to expand far outside of just enterprise software. And I think that's where people should be maybe less surprised over the next 24 months. Right. Michael, I'm assuming there are some parallels between the experience you're having at the moment, particularly in your inbox and mine and Caroline's, that since this story took off, you know, lots of emails come across about startups working in the field of AI. It's hard to discern and distinguish the, the sort of those players that have genuine promise, those that have something unique about them, that have a, you know, a strong underlying technology or IP. Is that your experience? Are you getting pitches? Are, you, are people seeking investment from you? And you're saying, God, I don't know what is real in the world of AI and what's not? Yeah, someone who has spent you know the better part of eight years in AI and, and also in similar time, my time in crypto from 2016 on, I'm used to these kind of hype cycles and people <laughs> adding verbiage, whether it's Web3 or now AI, to their um, to, you know to their pitch. I think that you have to kind of understand what are the uh, core special skills or special sauces of these founders and entrepreneurs. Are they product centric? Are they technology centric? Are they distribution centric? And I think really most of these teams are not technology centric and kind of are not at the bleeding edge of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And if you're not there, then you have to be elite on the product side. And so I think what we're going to see is both a lot of people that pitch AI and never even get there, but also a bunch of people that integrate you know, OpenAI APIs or other types of companies' APIs and build products that um, take up quite quickly, but are kind of suffering from death by a thousand cuts or yeah. suffering by having no real moats in these businesses. I think, as you brought up Google, and I think back to a UK startup, DeepMind, that it first purchased, and the focus that the UK had in artificial intelligence, where in the world are these companies getting built at the moment? Because we seem to be very US-centric about it at this moment in time. I actually think the UK is one of the most interesting places in the world for artificial intelligence today. I think it's the US, it's Canada, and Toronto, and Waterloo, and then the UK, um, and, and Europe has a few other disparate areas. but. The concentration of talent in those places is, is pretty obvious. And I think the best part, really for the UK specifically, we're investors in a company called Wave AI, which is a self-driving company using a very advanced type of machine learning to get their cars to drive themselves. What we're seeing now is a kind of renaissance of these machine learning researchers no longer wanting to be in research or academic settings. And so I think a lot of people in Europe specifically and London specifically were in DeepMind kind of really enjoying publishing these amazing papers, whether it was AlphaFold or a bunch of others. And now they're seeing ChatGPT hit 5 million people in a couple days. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, you know, it's, it's been cool sitting around and working on technology for the last few years, but it's time yeah. to go and build. All right, Michael Dempsey, managing partner at Compound, trying to discern what has promised and what does not in the world of AI. Now, coming up, the energy crisis in Europe, a potential recession in the US. Is there still some light at the end of the tunnel? IBM Vice Chairman Gary Cohn seems to think so. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Over in Davos, where the World Economic Forum is underway, some tech leaders are actually optimistic about the economy. IBM's vice chairman, Gary Cohn, for example, spoke to Bloomberg's David Weston about that and the energy crisis over in Europe. Have a listen. 
I thought that the risk to Germany was really the energy situation going into the winter to the extent that we had a very cold winter and they had to start rationing uh, energy and they had to cut back industrial Germany to keep people warm. I felt that that was a really tough situation potentially. We're, we're now deep enough into the winter and we sort of know where we are. We know what's in reserve and storage. I think Germany is going to get through the winter very, fairly easily with energy. And I think they're going to continue to power through this. So I, I, I'm in agreement with the chancellor. Biggest economy in Europe. What does that say about Europe in general? I think, no only recession in Europe? Well, I think Europe's going to muddle through this. The UK, not as clear. But it's, 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 it's not going to be easy. You know, we've still got pretty, pretty high inflation in Europe. It's, it's, it's a difficult situation. You know, in the United States, when we raise interest rates, it, we can all handle it. The, the interest rate picture in Europe that uh, Lagarde has to deal with is a, is a little bit different. You know, Ger Germany can handle higher interest rates as you start raising interest rates. Southern Europe has a lot more difficulty with the reality of what's going on. You were director of the National Economic Council, so you followed the U.S. economy pretty closely. What about the United States? What are the chances of recession? I talked earlier today with Jane Fraser of City. She thinks second half, it's quite possible. You know, it's interesting. We've been around Davos and everyone here is negative. So the, first of all, that, that tells me we should be positive. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, 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 you know, I was at a dinner last night with a, a a lot of CEOs, global CEOs, and you know, most of them raised their hand that they were pretty negative about the economy. Then when they talked about their business, they were all pretty positive about their business. So I think everyone thinks everyone else has a problem. My, my opinion is I'm pretty optimistic. That doesn't mean we're having a bullish economy. What I'm optimistic about is I think we can muddle through where we are. I think the Fed's getting to the end of their tightening cycle. We may have a couple more 25 basis point increases from the Fed. We top out around 5% in Fed funds here. But I think we've all factored that, factored that into the situation. And I, I feel like we're in a relatively good situation. The consumer is okay. They're not great. We're starting to see a few cracks. Um, the economy is slowing down, but I think we're going to muddle through. Muddling through with IBM's vice chair, Gary Cohn, over there in Davos. Meanwhile, let's talk about crypto for a moment, because shares of the bank Silvergate, they spiked today as it outlined steps like shedding assets to whether the FTX collapse. That's after posting a one billion loss earlier this month, remember. Look, Silvergate is a lender focused on digital asset industry at large, and it's trying to navigate the fallout from FTX, which prompted clients to draw down more than $7 billion in deposits. The company has said it's got $4.6 billion in cash on hand. Ed. Yeah, interesting. Earlier today, a big interest to our audience here in Silicon Valley. Our big interest globally was the Warriors over at the White House, Caro. Some keen startup investors themselves there, including Steph Curry, who you know looks at the world of startups. And then you've got Joe Lacob, one of the co-owners, also a partner at Kleiner Perkins. Big day for the Bay Area. This is Bloomberg. season is here. Wall Street expecting a bit of an ugly season. People may be overly pessimistic. We know growth is slowing. Companies are going to have a lot of questions to answer. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. Tons of banks coming out. Some of the worst returns when it came to profit. The markets really like that number. With exclusive expert analysis. What's your confidence in your outlook? you got to be selective. We still see a lot of opportunity. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Now, Ed, it's a pretty rare case, actually, of an activist targeting a prominent Chinese company. Now, his mean stock investor, well, actually, mean stock royalty, Ryan Cohen, he's taken a stake, get this, in Alibaba, and he wants the e commerce giant to buy back more shares, funnily enough. That could put Cohen maybe even at odds with China's own president, Xi Jinping, whose administration has kind of wiped out growth at Alibaba and other big tech companies. But is a returning of the guard. Bloomberg's Yushin Chen is with us, who's been reporting on this. And, and actually, first and foremost, we know his power over GameStop, over right. Bed Bath & Beyond, but he hasn't had much power over the share price movement of Alibaba on the day. Yeah, it's interesting because if you look at the share, the stock market reaction, Alibaba is actually down around 1.6% along with all the Chinese ADR stocks during the U.S. session. It only managed to go up slightly uh, overnight in Hong Kong when the news initially came out. So it's very different from the huge rally we saw in a meme stock right when he touched on. So 
I think it points to something about the bigger questions I'm hearing from investor. Is your question is because this is a Chinese company and as for an activist, how much real impact and the influence he could have on the board. Right. Because, you know, first, his stake is pretty small. Think about Alibaba as this huge tech giant of more than 300 billion market cap. And his stake, his position is like hundreds of millions. So that's limited power, right? And also, I think what's tricky and more interesting is Beijing's perspective mm. is Beijing is taking up the so-called golden shares. Uh, so it's a minority stake, but will allow the Chinese government um, to, you know, have the rights or, or the control over or influence on the board or sway in important decisions. So from that perspective, you know, the activist voice could ultimately be undermined, you know, if they are at odds, right? And so I think that also points to the overall background. It's very real. In China, you see a real activist uh, push. Just Asian investors yeah. also not much familiar with that uh, con uh, concept or you know that kind of campaign. Yeah, it was only last Thursday that the reports came out that that Chinese government entities were taking so-called golden shares, not just of Alibaba but Tencent as well. Yeah. And activism is more rare, right, when it comes to to China tech, mainland Chinese companies. I guess my question is: you strip out all the noise mm -hmm. and his demands. What is the outlook for Alibaba? You know, there was a bit more optimism at the end of 2022 because there was a pullback on COVID zero, a bit more supportive of e-commerce stocks. Yeah, that's right. Um, so one thing I would agree is right now, the, it's actually uh, for the activists or as an investor, uh, it's a pretty good entering point because many would argue now we are at an inflection point for China equities, right? At, like you mentioned, it's because of the lots of the China reopening trades is raising hope. And also on the regulatory front, we are seeing more and more signs Beijing is finally easing away from the regulatory crackdown and that's like the initial trigger that caused the brutal sell-off in Alibaba right so yeah. now you know people are more convinced the worst is behind that headwind is over and hopefully with this influential investors engagement it will lift the sentiment or you know bring more attention from the retail traders um, uh, in the US and right what about Alibaba buying back its own stock mm -hmm. I mean given they're still about 60% and the discounted versus the highs of 2020. Right, right. Would Alibaba's management, with or without Ryan Cohen, think it's not a bad idea? Yeah, uh, I agree. And actually, Alibaba has already started to do so from last year and has a expanded uh, shareholder uh, share buyback uh, program. So it's underway. I think it's just remain to see if like they will speed up the or ramp up the effort. But it's something like already on the table. If you're Ryan Cohen and you're trying to convince Alibaba's board or the Chinese government of change, which demand do you think is most likely? That's a difficult question, Yashin, but which demand is he pushing for most? Uh, I would think yeah, share buyback is probably uh, the right aspect, just given that they are still sitting on piles of cash and how to better use that part of uh, capital uh, is a, you know, a, a like strategy, I think the board needs to be considered, um, you know, thoroughly. Fascinating. I mean, what well, Alibaba is about 50 times the size of GameStop, so it's quite a different ballpark that he's playing in now. Yishun Chen, we thank you so, so much for staying atop the news. Meanwhile, Ed, you've had a little bit of news in the world of autos, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah, it was an interesting early start talking to GM because Chevrolet just unveiled the first ever electrified Corvette. Okay, electrified kind of, 70 years after the first Corvette concept was unveiled in New York City, actually. This is a hybrid, zero to 60 in 2.5 seconds, not a plug-in hybrid, though. And I caught up with GM's president, Mark Royce, about why they put a battery of sorts in their sports car and what this fits in with GM's transition to electric. Take a listen. The car itself is, is so different. Um, and it, it really is something that... Um, it takes advantage of the whole mid-engine architecture and getting power uh, to the front and rear wheels and makes it really an all-weather machine. So uh, we're very proud of it. It's, a, it's an engineering marvel. And, uh, you know, today's a big day for the whole team. This is the fastest ever production Corvette, the electric 
or electrified propulsion systems a big part of that, right? And going back to basics, this is not it a plug-in hybrid. They're two separate no. propulsion systems that, that work in conjunction with one another. My question, I guess, Mark, is, is this a sign that the, the Corvette customer is not ready to go full electric, to go full battery electric? That's a great question. Um, I think, uh, you know, the Corvette customer is ever changing and so is the car. And so I'd say, you know, this is the next step in the evolution of getting, um, you know, 160 horsepower in the front and 490 horsepower in the rear uh, all to the ground. And so, you know, it's a little faster, um, a little quicker, I should say, uh, than the Z06 at two and a half seconds. But, um, you know, it's, it's very different. And so when you drive the car from a vehicle dynamic standpoint, it's at home on the track, it's at home, you know, um, every day as Corvettes usually are uh, on, on all streets. So uh, this is the next step. And, you know, as I said, the, the Corvette buyer is ever changing. And so, you know, this is a pretty exciting time for us. And I don't think it's um, a question of whether someone's ready or not. You know, I think people are, when they look at the car and they discover um, the integration of the power, as you mentioned, Ed, and then, you know, how we're doing it and the sophistication and the integration of things like stealth mode and the launch itself. Uh, and then, the, like I said, the vehicle dynamics on a track when you actually have, you know, um, the front wheels actually pulling and, and doing things that, um, you know, the regular C8 doesn't do. So I think it's just the next evolution in, in uh, propulsion, performance, vehicle dynamics, and sophistication. Mark, let's get an update on, on the electrification plan more broadly. I think, you know, there's a lot of excitement and quite clearly uh, a, a book of demand for the Lyric and the Hummer EV. But, you know, from Bloomberg's reporting, the, the, the output still seems quite low for those two vehicles. What, what's the situation there? Well, you know, we, um, we, we, we bit off a lot in terms of having um, lower volume vehicles until our cell plants, um, our own cell plants, our Ultium cell plants are brought online. So we just brought our first plant online, you know, for the cells of all those vehicles in Lordstown, Ohio. The next one um, on a volume basis comes from in you know Spring Hill, which is built just adjacent to the Lyric. So um, we also you know this is these are all new electric vehicle platforms. They're not retrofit uh, architectures with batteries as some of our competitors have done. So um, we are doing this right. We're doing it for the next 20 years. We're not doing it for the next two years. And I think you're going to see those cell plants come online in high volume, which are, is happening right now. And you're going to see the output um, of the first Ultium vehicles increase quite dramatically over the next year. GM President, up early with our own Ed Ludlow. Great conversation, Ed. Meanwhile, look, more news in the auto world for you. Uber and Hertz, they're joining forces for expansion plans across Europe. And Hertz is going to be making as many as 25,000 electric vehicles available to Uber drivers in European capital cities by 2025. Almost 50,000 Uber drivers have rented a Tesla through Hertz since those two companies partnered last October. So the Uber Hertz expansion is going to begin with London this month, Ed. Yeah, fascinating. You talk about demand. I ask him where they're going to get all those EVs from. Anyway, coming up, a new bill in the UK could put tech executives behind bars. This is Bloomberg. This week, Bloomberg is live at the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland. As energy crises loom, wealth inequality intensifies, and global power dynamics dominate headlines, trust Bloomberg for the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis from the world's top leaders and experts. Coverage begins this week, only on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Meta Platform's president of global affairs, Nick Clegg, says the company is in a period of transition, but also in the very 
very early stages of that transition to the metaverse. That's as growing legislation and scrutiny is placed on social media apps around the world. Clegg spoke with Bloomberg TV's David Weston in Davos about the transition and the threat of other tech giants like TikTok owner ByteDance. Take a listen. So I think you've seen this huge pendulum swing from the kind of tech euphoria of the past where tech could do no wrong. You know, the, the, the era of the Arab Spring where all things bright and beautiful were, were held to be uh, produced by tech. And now, of course, the pendulum has swung pretty kind of pretty dramatically in an opposite direction. And everything that is bad, whether it's an election or a referendum outcome that people don't like or uh, individual distress is, is ascribed to social media. And I think part of part of kind of finding a, a resting place for that pendulum because extreme optimism and extreme pessimism are both as foolish as, he, as each other, of course involves regulation. There are issues like data privacy, um, content rules, data portability, uh, the rules of, 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 of how social media platforms should operate during election time and so on. All of those are rules that should be set, not by technologists, not by engineers on the West Coast, but by, but by, legislature, by legislators um, uh, elected by voters. And I think that's the process you're seeing it's most advanced in Europe but you're seeing that you're seeing that debate in DC um, as well it's not producing legislation as much as, 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 it, as it occurs but also in Brussels in London in, in 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 Australia you're seeing this move towards regulation I suspect some of it won't work very well and won't stand the test of time and other bits of regulation will will make sense and will stand the test of time I suspect one of the reasons you have your important position in meta is you have been on both sides I mean you have been right. elected to Parliament you have been deputy Prime Minister of the United Kingdom so you've seen the government side of it and now you're seeing the the private sector side of it as well, I'm not saying there's any right answer. I'm not asking for what the regulation is, but give us some principles from your experience on both sides of it. What are some basic principles you yeah. think that should be followed? Well, I think I think the secret is in that name. Although the sort of the, the, the best recipe is in that in that word principles. I think where where things go wrong is when legislators, who are not engineers, they're not technologists, they don't know how algorithms work or how AI works and so on and so forth. And given that technology evolves so rapidly, I think where things go wrong is where legislators try and impose some sort of of static uh, condition on, on technology that moves very fast. I think where, where legislation and regulation makes more sense is when it's based on some principles which are sort of evergreen principles that can that can apply to different technology and to technologies that evolve uh, over time. So to you know look at these big companies like Meta, like Google, like Twitter, like Apple and so on, look at their systems, hold their systems to account, but don't try and kind of micromanage every bit of content or every change in in, in you know every every change in, in the code that is used uh, to, to, to produce the product I think that's the that's the fundamental uh, lesson that I've certainly kind of observed so far as we sit here in Davos it strikes me one of the big issues not just in Davos but for the globe right now is some differences in systems yeah I mean there are differences between Europe and the United States in regulating tech for example but fundamentally the systems are the same China is quite different mm. they have a different approach to social media including other things uh, can we have a world in which those are Integrated, or do they have to essentially bifurcate? Does China have to go its way in social media and the West go its way? Well, I think they already have bifurcated. We don't have a we don't have a global internet. People keep talking about the global internet. It doesn't exist. You have a Chinese internet, which by its own on its own terms is highly successful. It's 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 walled off from the rest of the world. It's it's subject to a great deal of internal surveillance. But it doesn't it doesn't welcome, you know, for instance, Facebook is not allowed to operate in China, whilst of course Chinese social media companies are allowed to operate well, in the United that, States. TikTok. Yeah. TikToks, so for tick, example, tick, tick, how big a risk is that, a national security risk? Because many in Washington think it really is. Well, uh, look, I, I'll leave that to the national security experts. What I would observe, though, to your earlier question, which is, you know, the, there isn't a level playing field. Mm -hmm. um, Chinese social media companies are able to operate it, both in China and in Europe and America. We're able to operate in America and Europe, but not in China. So, you know, at the moment, it, it, there's an imbalance, it, imbalance there, which doesn't, I think, in the long run, make a, make a whole lot of sense and they and, and it's partly because the the approach to data, the approach to uh, privacy is just very, very different culturally and legally and politically in, in China than it is uh, elsewhere. And then there are slightly more subtle, narrower differences between the EU and the US mm -hmm. as well. And I think one of the interesting dynamics you have is that you have the European Union now leading on new rules, leading on new regulation, 
but not leading technologically or, or commercially. You don't have I mean, all the big tech giants are either in the United States or China, and yet it's Europe that doesn't have the big tech giants that is inventing the rules for them. So it's a very interesting jigsaw where I, I, would, I would actually add a fourth element, I think India. I think you have Europe, mm. America, China, and India. Those are the four great big sort of jigsaw pieces that make up uh, how the, the internet operates in the modern world. Meta Platform's president of global affairs, Nick Clegg, there having a very global and a very legislation focused conversation there. Let's talk about global legislation. Let's talk about the UK, of course, where Nick Clegg used to be, well, deputy prime minister, because it could be on the verge of passing legislation that could put social media bosses behind bars if they break certain rules. Now, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak intends to sign the online safety bill with criminal sanctions for tech executives. Look, the bill aims to protect anyone under 18 from harmful content. That means if regulators find that a platform has been pushing teens to see content inciting violence, harassment, misinformation, for example, some executives could face up to two years behind bars. The online safety bill is expected to be signed as early as spring, Ed, and this is after what was a big backlash from his own Conservative Party members, the backbenchers, as right. they're known, wanting to take out a certain amendment that would remove any criminal liability. And what's so interesting is basically taking a leaf out of Ireland's book, right, because they've already sort of got this precedent set. You know, all social media players have been thinking about this issue for years. And I think Meta's a really interesting example in light of what the UK is doing, because go back to 2019, Zuckerberg's op-ed in the Washington Post, we need new rules for the internet. Meta, then Facebook, shouldn't be the ones to form those rules. Then you have the Meta Oversight Board, an independent body brought in, it's always been that someone else should act. Well, now they are acting, and this is actually a pretty sort of severe uh, course of action the UK appears to be taking. It's interesting. I think the Irish legislation, for example, it does have checks before that. Isn't suddenly you're deemed legally culpable and you're put behind bars. I mean, you get apparently a series of checks, including if they do not comply with warning notices from the country's online safety commissioner. And in fact, these rules are already applied to certain industries in the UK. Just think of, I don't know, builders, for example, construction companies, banks even, do have a layer of right. accountability up to the highest executives. It's just going to be interesting how this is kind of navigated both legally and in practice. Yeah, and social media is just as societally important as those things that you just mentioned. So it will be slow moving. We'll see. Now, coming up, can you put a price on love? Tinder is considering a subscription that will cost you, wait for it, $6,000 per year. This is Bloomberg. Can you put a price on love? Well, Hinge, the dating app owned by Match, thinks so. They're gonna be offering a new subscription level at 50 to $60 a month. The idea, go after Gen Z app users who are, quote, highly motivated daters, and in return, offer them enhanced features that boost their profile and their chances of finding a match. But it's quite a jump from Hinge's existing $35 a month offering. Now, Match teased the new Hinge tier in their latest earnings report, saying it would be targeted at, quote, the most intentioned users who have a higher, quote, propensity to pay. $50 to $60 a month. Can you put a price on love? Can you? Did you? I mean, I know that you're a man who's... Well, many have found love, right, through for certain dating right. applications. And would you, in hindsight, spend 6000 a year? But it is kind of an amazing way to be amplifying your margin at this particular moment. Right. But these are two different products, right? So you have Hinge, $60 a month, palatable. You've then got Tinder thinking about $500 a month. <laughs> well, we asked the audience, right? What do they think? Uh, I think the results are pretty... Well, Stop. they speak for themselves, Caroline. <laughs> I mean, we threw in sort of 
are you sitting on the sense on the fence or do you think this is all ridiculous and it seems as though it's all ridiculous romance is dead ed 61 percent think that seven percent said yes sign me up i feel as though this is trying to take on those sort of elitist or indeed right. elite dating apps where you do pay an amount but you get right. perhaps a little bit more of a specific mm, targeted audience to you at least Right, full disclosure, I met my wife on Hinge all those years ago. Had I known oh. then what I know now, cough up the cash, probably. <laughs> Do it, they work. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Wednesday, we're gonna be talking all things crypto and Bitcoin's bullish run with DYDX. Hey, Ed. Yeah, don't forget, there's so much to recap. The podcast on the terminal, Apple, iHeart, Spotify. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.